A druid is a part of a landscape, no matter where the druid finds herself, whether he lives in a rural countryside or in the midst of urban sprawl, he knows that he is a part of an ecosystem. Every day he attunes with that ecosystem, for it is a part of him just as much as he is a part of it. To know that ecosystem is to know himself. Our Neolithic and Celtic ancestors knew the importance of such places, marked as they were often by stone circles and hinges, created for whatever purpose was needed. We needn't always return to ancient sites, and indeed we can create new ritual sites where we can honor all that we hold dear. New ritual sites are opening up across the country and in many people's private backyards. I have a very small stone circle set up in my back garden where I meditate and pray. I also travel to an ancient tumulus which is about a four-mile round tree by foot. There I connect with the she, the fairy folk, the ancestors and the other world on a deeper level. Joanna van der Hoeven, The Crane Bag, A Druid's Guide to Ritual Tools and Practices. Hello, I'm Dennis. I'm an Ovate in the order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. Welcome to my channel where I talk about Druidry, Nature and Magic. In this video I'd like to talk about the importance of traveling and share some memories of my trip to a Slavic village of the 10th century that I visited two years ago. Druidry is a path of searching for connection, attuning and communion with the wild and with the divine that coexist in nature. Traveling is a discovery, a kind of magic. Travel changes you, as the hobbits once sang. Home is behind, the world ahead, and there are many paths to tread. When I travel, I become a part of the place I'm attending, and the place in its turn becomes a part of me. Communion with the sight is about making connection, sharing and exchanging of the most intimate thoughts, feelings and experiences. Travelling isn't restricted to physical being at a certain time, at a certain place. It can be done in many other ways, by reading books or by joining in your inner sacred growth. Each of these ways is unique and strengthens the other ones, yet balance is the key. Try to avoid overdoing only one kind of traveling. Practice them all. So leave your beautiful white robe at home, you won't need it today. Change into your most comfortable and practical outfit, best suitable for traveling during the hot weather season in northwest Russia. For today, I am taking you on a short trip to a place you will hardly visit during your stay in my country. It's neither the Hermitage nor Peterhof. It's not listed in popular travel guides, but the history and the energy of that place will let you explore and connect with the ancient roots of pagan Russia. Welcome to the Slavic village of the 10th century, an open-air museum in Lubitina, Novgorod region, northwest Russia. The place for the museum wasn't chosen by chance. Archaeologists discovered remains of a Slavic village near a Sopka, Russian for tumulus. The village was reconstructed in 2006-2008 and it gives us a good example of how a Slavic village might look like in many other places across the 10th century northwest Russia. The key word here is reconstruction. It means meticulous work of historians, archaeologists and an architect was also involved in building of the Vitaslavlitsi Open Air Museum of Wooden Architecture. So, it's a strict reconstruction, almost no additions. Almost because they did add a smithy, not every settlement had one, and a cellar, there has been no archaeological data confirming its existence at that place. You won't find a church or any attributes of the Christian faith in the village it's the 10th century. Christianity has already been adopted in the country, but there hasn't been any trace of it here. The Sopka, tumulus, in the village is genuine. They lie the ashes of the founder of the family, the most important person in the village, 
also known as the Elder. He lies alone. But there are tumuli where two, three people were buried. Usually those were the Elder's sons. Common people weren't buried in Sopka. There was a different place for them. One of my most amazing personal discoveries was the heating of the huts, called a blackway heating. It means there were no stovepipes. In a blackway heating, the smoke escapes through a special hole in the ceiling, whereas in a whiteway heating, there are exhaust pipes to vent the smoke. In order to save heat in the hut, there were no windows, and the door was so small that people had to crawl through the doorway. Women would heat the stove, which was just a pile of stones, to keep the heart warm. And while she was doing it, the rest of the family would wait outdoors, even in winter. If she knew how to heat the heart properly, then only the ceiling would be covered in soot. The walls would stay clean. As you can see, the interior of the heart was modest, to say the least. There were no bathhouses either. The heart was both housing and a bath at the same time. To wash yourself, you would need to heat up some water on the stove, and you would pour water on the stones if you wanted a steam bath. So, people washed their bodies where they lived. As you can imagine, living conditions of the 10th century were harsh. The whole way of living was built around hard work in accordance with daylight hours. Hard was a place where people could eat and sleep after a hard day's work. I hope you enjoyed this short trip to the roots of pagan Russia. That small village is a true place of power and history. But to reveal its secrets, one must approach it as a traveler, not as a tourist. I encourage you to travel, explore and connect to the land where you live. Blessed be your path. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.